Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for being here this evening. Tonight's event is sponsored by Intercultural and International Student Services, Intercultural Directions Council, and the Exploring Latin American Cultures. Before I begin, I'm going to begin, or I'm going to start with a prayer by MLK's prayer. Oh God, we thank you for the fact that you have inspired men and women in all nations and in all cultures. We call you different names. Some call you Allah, some call you Elohim. Some call you Jehovah, some call you Brahma. Some call you the unmoved mover, but we know that these are all names for one and the same God. Grant that we will follow you and become so committed to your way and your kingdom that we will be able to establish in our lives and in this world a brother and sisterhood. That we will be able to establish here a kingdom of understanding where men and women will live together as brothers and sisters and respect the dignity and worth of every human being. In the name and spirit of Jesus, amen. So today we have the honor of having dinner with Mike Benitez, and I'm gonna begin with telling you a little bit about him. Michael Benitez is a leading national social justice educator and activist scholar with extensive experience in education and diversity issues. Michael is known for his down-to-earth, insightful commentary and critical perspectives on social and cultural issues. Benitez has served higher education in different capacities over the last 15 years, including academic affairs, student affairs, diversity and inclusion, and teaching. Benitez completed both his bachelor and master's degree at the Pennsylvania State University, where he also worked with and helped revive and strengthen the university's college assistant migrant program with and helped, oh, I already said that. <laughs> Throughout his career, he has been recognized with several leadership awards and has served in increasingly broad and challenging roles. In previous roles, Benitez has served as Director of Intercultural Development and the Black Cultural Center at Lafayette College, Director of Diversity Initiatives and Social Justice, He's also served as Director of Intercultural Engagement and Leadership at Grinnell College. A highly sought out speaker and workshop leader at conferences and colleges across the nation, Benitez has authored book chapters and articles on topics of identity, cultural centers, ethnic studies, pedagogy, and hip hop culture. He's also been featured in several documentaries, including The N-Word, Is There a Message to the Madness? the system of racial inequality, and cracking the codes. Uh, currently, he is Chief Diversity Officer and Dean of Diversity and Inclusion at the University of Puget Sound. Let's all please welcome Michael Benitez. Hello, everyone. How y'all doing? Now y'all now, now know that was kind of weak. <laughs> so I'm gonna I'm go at it again. Hey, uh, what's up y'all, how y'all doing? Ah, yeah. uh, that's some peace right there, thank you. Uh, thank you for the lovely intro, uh, much appreciated. Uh, I, wanna, I wanna begin uh, just by, by saying thank you, Brandon, for, for, for having me out here. Um, uh, I'd like to thank the Office of Intercultural and, and International Student Services and obviously the College of St. Benedict and St. John's University uh, for the invitation to come and share this very special day uh, with you all. So thank you very much. Um, you know, I had a lot to say, uh, and I really want to speak from, from my heart today. This last year was a very, very uh, difficult year. We, we really witnessed in the public domain uh, and, and the social landscape, uh, much of what's been going on for quite some time, but has, has finally surfaced in a way that I think a lot of folks uh, were, were not ready for. Uh, so with that said, uh, can we all just, just chill and sit for about 30 seconds uh, in, in a moment of silence and, and, and reflect uh, 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 and acknowledge many of the lives that have been lost over the past year uh, as a result of the uh, injustice and the inhumanity. Right on. 
thank you. Uh, you know, in doing this work sometimes, it could be an incredible space and it could be a really lonely place, right? Issues of justice, issues of humanity, uh, how you share that, how you engage folks, talking about very difficult, difficult issues. Um, so it's nice when you have an opportunity to share and journey with folks. Uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the incredible work and the activism uh, that has been carried out by many brave and courageous souls across this nation and the Black Lives Matter movement uh, who continue to uphold the legacies of activism across the United States and that we seek to honor today as we remember and honor the late Dr. Martin Luther King, a legacy that we should aim to honor each and every day of the year, not just January. As we reflect on the legacy of Dr. King, uh, it's also important to, to be mindful about how these issues are engaged and considered uh, throughout the year, and the many connections and intersections with other leaders, right? Uh, the reality is that without an Ella Baker, uh, there wouldn't be a Martin Luther King. Without a Dolores Huerta, there wouldn't be a Cesar Chavez. And the investability around gender and women leaders in particular always makes me want to say that right in front about the power and influence women have had historically uh, in activism and social justice work, but who are often relegated to the margins and silenced uh, through lack of representation. So I just wanted to go ahead and, and, and say that out uh, and bring that humanity back to the space of activism. It's evident that we are indeed in a very particular and tell a moment in this nation's history, a moment temporarily defined by national events, telling of how far we have really come, a moment of continued de facto segregation and a morale defined by neoliberal and corporeal values that render invisible those voices at the margins. You see, Dr. King did not walk alone. He walked and he struggled with communities of ordinary people who sought justice and human rights, who understood that the time was just as important then as it is this day in our present lives. Dr. King's legacy is not only representative of his leadership and activism, but also in the triumphs and the human dignity of many great people before those he fought alongside with, as well as those currently in the front lines today who continue to challenge inhumane actions and illusions of equality. We celebrate Dr. King, and that's great, but we have also, unfortunately, also cultivated a culture of romanticism and inaction not aligned with Dr. King's call to action. Today, many leaders across an array of corporate, religious, educational, and political spaces will partake in some form of celebratory festivity in honor of Dr. King, but few have had the courage and conviction to take action and make decisions that challenge the very structural and institutional uh, inequities and inhumane practices that he fought for and stood up for. Today, the very issues of injustices and social inequalities that Dr. King spoke against and organized to change, such as militarism and war, poverty and income disparities, and white supremacy and racism continue. I, I bring that out to say that when we talk about these issues today, we relegate them at times to something that has been accomplished, something that has been done, but there's a, a reality about the foundation, unfortunately, of, of this great nation that we have to face and deal with every single day. You can't get rid of it. So the concept of when will racism be eradicated it's not the question. The question is, how do we continue to respond to an issue that continuously evolves to represent something else and serves as a form of resistance to the very resistance that it faces? That's the question that needs to be asked. And not only do they continue, some of, some of the disparities uh, uh, of racism and, and white supremacy are very evident. They are severe. And in some cases, they are worse than those Dr. King faced during his times outside of, of death. While the civil rights movement eventually led to the rupture and an end to legal segregation, the concept of integration does not necessarily translate into a democratic practice and equity. Though 21st century rhetoric claims diversity to be a central tenet to how societies claim they function 
and progress, much diversity and inclusion work is discussed and practiced without regard to historical, political, systemic underpinnings and constructions of power, disparity, and difference situated across societal spaces. Thus, the idea of celebrating Dr. King should not be limited to service. Those service is so, so incredibly important. The idea of celebrating uh, uh, Dr. King should also be represented in the form of action that unapologetically aims to dismantle inhumanity and realizing a dream deferred. I can stand before you today and I could offer a series of MLK quotes, but I prefer to speak from the heart and speak directly to the issues facing us during this time uh, that I believe align with Dr. King's understanding of egalitarian humanism. Okay, so there is one, one quote, one quote in particular that I do want to share in the spirit of what it means to uphold legacies of activism in the 21st century. He goes on to say, or he went on to say, cowardice asks the question, is it safe? Experience asks the question, is it politic? Vanity asks the question, is it popular? But conscience asks the question, is it right? You see, there comes a time where one must take a position that is neither safe, nor politic, nor popular. But he must do it because conscience tells him that it is right. It is the right thing to do. I've been in education for quite a bit. And addressing issues of inclusion, diversity, and equity, justice, you name it. And I'm always, I can't say I'm always surprised, but in a way I'm always surprised at how much data is out there over the last 40, 50 years that says these were issues that were present before, but these are also issues that are present now. And how hesitant we are, leaders, to make decisions based on that very same data that tells you exactly what needs to change and how to change it. I chose this quote in particular because it speaks to the type of diversity leadership necessary to bring much needed revolutionary change in what and how we as a society value. I have spent many times this past year reflecting on much of the injustices alongside the world, uh, a world who has also witnessed firsthand the hypocrisy that this nation's citizenry has observed for quite some time. This past year has been heavy on my soul, we have witnessed too many and brown lives gone at the hands of racism and police brutality, a continued growth in the economic gap uh, between the haves and have-nots, and continued conversations to point to war and forceful violence as a remedy of choice. All, all this in a society that screams democracy and humanity, but does very little to eradicate the very same violence and terrorism that we ourselves are quick to resolve to. You see, the concept of activism is beautiful when you practice it. Let me give you an example. One day, my partner and I were you know, chilling in the kitchen, and we're cooking, because you know, I like to cook. For those that don't know, I got a culinary degree, so I get down, you know? Uh, at that point, my son came into the kitchen, and he said, he said, Dad, Mom, I'm boycotting the cafeteria. He's in fifth grade. And you know me, I looked at him with excitement because you know I'm an activist. So I'm like, what's up, Papito? You're gonna boycott the cafeteria? What's going on? So he comes with a story, he says, you see that? I received a slice of pizza, and when I got it, it had a piece of hair in it. And when I tried to take it back, they wouldn't give me another slice. And that's not cool. So I decided that I'm gonna boycott. Now obviously the boycott comes with me and his mom preparing his lunch, right? So more, yeah, more, more work for us. But we were like, okay, papi, I got you. We're, we're gonna support you and we'll, we'll hook up your lunch. Meanwhile, his younger sister, three years on, younger, asked a, a question. She asked, Mikey, what's boycotting? In that moment, Mikey started to define for his young sister what boycotting was. He goes on to say, well, like boycotting, right? You gotta think of an eight-year-old. It's like, well, like boycotting is like when, um, when like people do like really uncool stuff, and and so because it's not it's not cool and and it's not right, then you don't want to support them and give them your money. And I was like, okay, right on, right on. That's you know, eight-year-old understanding, nice definition of of boycotting. 
And then my uh, uh, young daughter turned to us, and then she goes, Mom, Dad, I'm going to need you to pack me my, my lunch, too. So we're like, why? What's up, Mommy? What happened with you? Right? Terms of endearment, right? We say, Mommy, are you going to boycott the cafeteria, too? And she kind of stood back in her very conscious self, and she said, no, I'm girl-cutting the cafeteria. <laughs> And that was beautiful, right? Because at, at age you know, five and six, uh, she was able to, to sort of kind of pick up on the use of dominant discourse and, and, and embrace and create sort of language that represented what she perceived as her. So that was just really dope to see. But that's the type of, of, of mindset and ideology and the type of practice that when you engage this work and you talk and you share, uh, that's the result. It's, it's young folks, young people who are willing to understand and take on these issues and who will grow up to challenge uh, such issues. Because you have to understand the young mind. When we think about activism, we often suppress the youth voices. But let, let, let me say that the youth voices are the most critical voices of any movement, always have been, always will be, with the support of elders, obviously. But that's the voice that you can never really, really eradicate. Why? Because there will always be young people. That's why hip hop culture is so, so powerful. Because there will always be youth that are going to come up and spring up and challenge whatever is the next inequity present. So, let's talk a little bit about poverty. For the first time in more than 50 years, more than half of kids attending school live below or near poverty rate. I want you to think about that. For the first time in 50 years, more than half of kids attending public school live below or near poverty rate. 51% of kids in school districts. 15% of the US population, about 47 million, live below the official poverty rate of 24,000 per year for a family of four. An additional 5%, or about 18 million, live near poverty. So you're talking about a fifth, 20% of an incredibly wealthy and rich nation that lives in poverty or near poverty, yet we celebrate something that we need to be not only celebrating, but actually taking formal, concrete action. Add to this, while employment data has shown improvement, a small step in the right direction, what the numbers don't show is how many of the newly created jobs are low-wage occupations, comprising 1.85 million jobs than prior to the recession, according to the National Employment Law Project. Adding yet another variable, considering race into the equation, uh, Economic Policy Institute in 2013 reported that between 1963 and 2012, blacks, exactly 11.6%, have had a consistent annual unemployment rate twice as high as that of their white peers at 5.1% with whites faring below the recession rate, while black unemployment has fared well above the recession rate, with Latinos being in that middle. That's, that's an important number to understand since the 1960s. 11% above recession unemployment rate. Related data also points to a disparity in racial representation of poor children living in areas of concentrated poverty with 45% black children at the top of that list, higher than that of First Nation people at 39%, which is still high, 35% of Latinos, which is still high, 21% of Asian and Pacific Islanders, and 12% of white children living in areas of concentrated poverty. That's an important, those are important numbers to know. That means that for the last 50, 60 years, we've thought that we've progressed and gotten better, but in many ways, we've actually taken many, many steps backwards when we actually look at the data. Now let's take a look at law enforcement and incarceration. Another, uh, another number that 
one may, may not be aware of, beyond the higher proportion of incarcerated racially minoritized people or people of color. You see, I like to use the term minoritized because, like, right, I don't like just hop out of my mom on some minority status like you're a minority. But over time, my body, who I am, the way I present myself, is minoritized and compared against the dominant norms that, that dominate culture in the US. When compared to white counterparts, is that the racial disparity and in incarceration rates is bigger than it was in the 1960s. According to 2010 data from the Pew Research Center, uh, with uh, Latinos being close to three times as likely than whites to be incarcerated, and blacks being six to seven times as likely to be incarcerated or locked up. Now, this was not a new phenomenon yesterday, and it is far from a new phenomenon today. Scholars such as Michelle Alexander, Naomi uh, Murakawa, uh, you know, the authors of the New Jim Crow and the First Civil Right, How Liberals Build Prison in America, have pointed to such issues as those situated in what today we refer to as the prison industrial complex. Now, how do children situated in and served in the public good fare? A recent report by the Southern Education Foundation found that 51% of students in, in public uh, education were eligible for free and or reduced lunch. These are kids who we are attempting to focus on educating, who we engage in conversations and dialogues about bringing them up and preparing them for tests and assuring that they do well. Meanwhile, the only thing that they have in their head is how the heck are they going to eat the next day. Those are the realities that face us today. So when we think about MLK, what he stood for, these are some of the issues that we have to take into consideration as we celebrate and also take action. Action being incredibly important. Now let's turn to police brutality. Need I, need I need to say more than what we have been observing in the media over the course of the last year? I'm not saying it has not gone on for long as one need not only examine history and the role police have had in maintaining control of black and brown bodies and people. I am saying that this past couple of years, folks have been witnessing the public surfacing of what has been transparent all along with respect to the lived realities and experiences around racial profiling and black and brown targeting. Ferguson is but the final straw that pushed many over that edge. Why does this matter and why does this need to be acknowledged and acted upon? Because armed white folks are not getting shot. Now, I'm not suggesting they get shot, but I do suggest that black and brown folks are treated with the same fairness in how they get arrested as their white counterparts. So what do we have? Let me see. San Francisco. Armed white guy has a standoff with police and a pistol. And if you've been on social media, you've seen this cat with a gap, with a gun, pointing at police while he moves towards them. He wasn't shot. I agree. I don't think anyone should get shot. Again, I like to see that extended to other folks. Long standoff in San Diego. White, white male points gun at police officers and children uh, for about an hour. He was arrested. Tennessee, white man arrested twice for road rage with a gun. He was arrested. New Hampshire, white guy arrested for firing a BB gun at officers. Meanwhile, Tamir Rice, 12 years old, was walking around a Cleveland park holding a toy gun that uses non-lethal plastic pellets. A police cruiser pulled up, and within two seconds, 12-year-old Rice was shot and killed. In Idaho, men were taken into custody after shooting a Walmart up a Walmart with BB guns. Both were intoxicated, yet James Crawford was shot to date as a result of a validated phone call without checking in. He was just carrying the BB rifle. Just this month, white guy arrested after pointing gun at a Pennsylvania police officers. When police approached the vehicle, the man pulled a handgun from his coat pocket and pointed it at police. And somehow, he still made it to jail and lived to, to, to uh, see another day. I point that out because in doing a lot of this work, 
And then keeping it absolutely real, not like a Dave Chappelle when keeping it real goes wrong, but when keeping it real goes right, right? I'm always fascinated and struck at how quickly we want to hop on all these different identities, which I agree. We need to focus on, on gender. We need to focus on sexual orientation. We need to focus on class. We need to focus on disability and age and any of the other injustices that I'm not naming because there are incredible, incredible amount. But for us, to right away dismiss race as something that, that needs no further attention and to talk about race in a post-racial context as if that's no longer an issue is actually part of the cause of what we're seeing today. We are seeing folks get comfortable with shooting black and brown bodies without regard for what's going to happen because they are confident and know that nothing's going to happen to them. That is an issue. That is a serious issue that is almost no different than what folks got away with in the 60s. We're not seeing a lot of difference. Now, a lot of folks talk about posts, post-racial, post-racial. Well, I have a post. This is a post situated more in, in theoretical understanding, almost like a post-modern or a, a post-structural, not a post as an afterward. But when you think about post-racial, perhaps the conversation needs to be, how has racism now metamorphosized and manifested in ways that is practiced beyond the white body in forms of internalized colonization, in form of internalized oppression, in form of internalized racism? So that it's not just a concept practiced by, by white folks, it's also a concept practiced by folks from different arenas. The concept of reverse racism that folks talk so much about, while it's evident and understandable, there's no such thing as reverse racism. Racism is racism, whether it's practiced in the majority sense of white folks or whether it's practiced by black and brown bodies who have created enough self-hatred to put it out there. Now, if we're talking about overt actions, then we're talking about racial bigotry. But racism still remains very much an issue in the front lines of what we need to address considerably. But again, the conviction behind the work, the time is always now, right? So often we get away from race as a place of focus in higher ed. When it needs to be the very, very focus that intersects with everything else, It is this white supremacy and racism that runs deep in the psyche of many that needs to be eradicated. Let me be clear. I'm not making a call for retaliation against the police as a result of structural injustice. That's not cool. Like Gandhi, like, like Dr. King, like Cesar Chavez, I also believe in, in nonviolent uh, activism and practice. Yeah, that means I might get beat down somewhere, but that is the work. I'm calling for a fairness. The handling of arrests that black and brown people can live another day like their white counterparts. Let's look at some further stats. Between 2004 to the end of 2013, 511 police officers were killed in felonious acts by 540 offenders. Of those offenders, 52% were white and 43% were black. If we look at the racial breakdown of similar data over a 33-year period, the results are the same. From 1980 to 2013, 2,269 officers were killed. 52% of the killers were white, 41% of the killers were black, representing the perpetrators uh, 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 repping, you know, uh, uh, more likely to rep whiteness than, than blackness, uh, which is contrary to the way that it's represented and shown and depicted in the media. When it comes to health coverage, blacks and browns are still far more uh, likely to be uninsured than their white counterparts. This holds true both for adults and for children. In education, a superintendent in Alabama school bans high school history club from seeing Selma. I, I need us to, to really grapple 
with that idea, while education leaders continue to target cultural studies that provide critical values for understanding and examining such issues anchored in American history. Let's not get it twisted. What we're seeing in Arizona and Texas and other places is, 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 is an attack on non-white cultural dynamics and studies uh, and, and a relegation of those studies and those lived realities and experiences to the margins. Experiences that are just as American as America itself. When one thinks about Chicano politics, Chicano identity, very situated in the US. When one thinks about hip hop culture, that is an American bred culture. Nothing un-American about it. If anything, the contrary. But these are the arguments that folks are using to say why those uh, uh, disciplines of study should not be areas of focus in education. Recently in Texas, religious bigots and protesters upset that a Muslim group was hosting a conference and telling Muslim Americans that they're not Americans. As you think through the ways of really understanding the severity of racism in the US, look to other speeches given by Dr. King. Beyond I have a dream, look at the speech, the three evils of society, and why I'm opposed to the war in Vietnam. Leadership in the 21st century requires of all of us to support movements that aim to dismantle the overt and obvious racism that we observe time and time again. If you support Dr. King's philosophy and the dream we often refer to, you should also support ongoing movements and efforts to address racial and ethnic inequality, such as those present in the way that police enforcement interacts with different populations, in particular also in immigration reform and migrating communities. The reality is that if we spend a little bit more time talking about foreign policy, and how we are forcing families to have to migrate. Never mind that these are issues that historically have been a normal part of First Nation people's lives. And then we wonder also, when we think about the hills of California, we think about forest fires. You know, I'll share something with you as a, as a, as a First Nation at Taino Puerto Rican. Um, there is a reason why First Nation peoples migrate. There's a reason why they don't stay in certain parts of, of, of a particular geographic location throughout the year. And that has to do with how much sun or how much flooding. Uh, so the moment that we begin to build houses and take over land and mistreat the land and mistreat the earth, that is also the moment that we put ourselves in jeopardy to die at the hands of Mother Nature, not because Mother Nature is getting crazy, but because we're making decisions that go contrary to the earthly needs. More recently in the film Selma, right? Uh, great film. Great, great film. I couldn't be happier because it was the, firm, the, the first film I've watched that represented Dr. King in his flaws that represented Dr. King and his intentionality, represented how the movements were driven by the ordinary people, not necessarily Dr. King. He was there in leadership, but it was all, the entire communities that led the movements. He wasn't trying to be on the pedestal, but over time he has been put on the pedestal. Even Angela Davis, back in 2005, I had the opportunity to interview her, and I asked her a very young and immature question. I said, Angela, without knowing how to react, right? Because I'm like, damn, like I'm in front of Angela. Like, I don't, how, how, how do I ask her questions? Somebody I really look up to. I said, what does it mean to be Angela? What does it mean to be this iconic activist figure today? She just almost looked at me like, Michael, you are a young person, you, uh, who still has quite a bit to learn. <laughs> she said, I never called myself an activist. I never took that title upon myself. I never claimed to be one. I was simply sticking up for my friends. Everything else are imposed titles that everybody else assigned unto me, that they imposed unto me. That's very, very important to understand about the way that we look at folks who do the work. They are ordinary people. 
There are folks who live and breathe and are part of this, this many movements. But we, and our social media frenzy, and our, 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 the, the way we, we gravitate towards putting folks on pedestal, whether on Hollywood or activists, is, is, is part of the rupture that prevents us from moving forward collectively and goes against what is needed in order to achieve this work moving forward. You know what I want to see? Instead, instead of reporters going to Marshawn Lynch and forcing him to say thank you, God bless, thank you, yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you, over and over again, can, can corporations also impose that very same uh, 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 policy on our politicians? Can they impose that on police officers so that they don't go and scave your way for a week or two weeks? Can they have, should they, shouldn't they be able to sit there in front of folks and be questioned and interrogated as to why they are making decisions and killing folks off? Why are we so interested in Martian Lynch? Just wants to play football. Instead, that policy should apply to the real folks that need to answer some very real questions. So as I think about Selma II, I think about the lack of respect that it got at the awards. Phenomenal, phenomenal film. Powerful, riveting, so, so, so nicely portrayed. Granted, it didn't capture the whole movement, they didn't capture everything that had to do with Bloody Sunday. It didn't capture quite a bit. It focuses, like film, on very particular areas of history. You can only do so much with a couple of hours. But everybody wanted to get caught up on what was missing. But nobody's looking at other films and saying, hmm, that's a limited understanding. When I think about American Sniper, that's about as anti-MLK as it gets. You're talking about a cat who's out engaging in warfare, obviously, by, by way of military. And I understand that military uh, is perhaps necessary and needed with nations, but not as puppets. Not as folks who are sent away to fight and die for corporeal interest, uh, as opposed to an actual uh, uh, representation of protecting nations and borders. In a recent op-ed by Congressman John Lewis, he goes on to write, with poignant grace, Selma demonstrates that Occupy, inconvenient protests and die-ins that disturb our daily routine reflect a legacy of resistance that led many to struggle and die for justice, not centuries ago, but in our lifetimes. It reminds us that they could be approaching, what they could be approaching when that price will be required again. When I think about activism and what's necessary, I think about courage, I think about compassion, I think about us sometimes just putting away the TV and social media and actually paying attention and getting engaged. You know, before, it was a very different type of sacrifice. Like, folks were actually dying, dying, dying. Today, it's all about sacrificing some time, maybe getting a pair of, you know, holding off on a pair of sneakers, maybe saying, well, you know, I think I'm gonna miss cups today, or, or NYPD Blue, or whatever is the, the preferred show of choice for folks. But instead, we support it, we say how much we support it, but we're not there. I could imagine if educational institutions were put in a situation where they had to respond, where they had to get engaged a conviction and a courage to do something. Can one imagine what a registrar's office would look like if two to three hundred students all decided to transfer out at the same time? Can one imagine for athletes, right? Because back in the day, you had very different folks who were in positions of leadership and power. And today, we're looking to athletes. So how do we put pressures on athletes? Let's say a whole basketball team just decided, until this is addressed, we're not playing. Issues like that, actions like that, that really kind of hit and rupture economy in, 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 in a way that it's going to matter and that it's going to force uh, corporations and folks to react in ways where something is going to be done. 
When I think about what's needed today in upholding legacies, I also think about uh, service. But I think about sharing. Sharing is really, really important. Let me tell you why. Storytelling, the art of storytelling. I've spoken to so many who don't know their own histories, who don't know their own stories, whose parents attempted to protect them the same way that they say, I experienced this pain, I don't want to pass it on to my son or my daughter because it's too hard. And by doing that, by not sharing and passing along the stories, what happens is you remove their ability. You remove that medicine that they need to be able to recognize the inflictions when they experience them to be able to address them appropriately. That's what happens when we stop sharing stories and storytelling. We take away that possibility for a young person to know what he or she is facing. So by the time that we get to college, we at least have some understanding of what we're up against as opposed to struggling with many of the issues, rightfully so, that we struggle because we come from school systems that have a very limited understanding and idea of the way that they want to teach history and our stories to us. When I, think, when I think about what leadership looks like in the 21st century to, to uphold legacies, I think about strategic thinking and intentionality. Everything has to be thorough and well thought out. We could engage and, and have silos all over the U.S. And, and engage these issues and tackle these issues, but until we have an agenda and we know exactly what we want, we're going to continue to engage in actions that will not take us very far because we have not yet been able to come together as a collective. When I think about leadership, when I think about activism today, I think about what are the different ways that young folk could come together to be able to sacrifice and struggle we got to put away the concept of immediate gratification to try to see something that is not going to show up tomorrow, that it's going to take time. Giving up a month, giving up two months or three months is nothing to a, li a lifetime worth of the possibilities for equity and justice. And perhaps I have a very particular passion. I grew up, my mom made $6,000 a year. I lived in two shelters. I was homeless for two years. The first shelter kicked us out when I turned 12 because I was too old, uh, too, too old of a young male to live in that shelter. So I got to see quite a bit, and even today, my son and my daughter, my daughter was suspended last year, a straight A student, for one day in fifth grade suspended for one day because she decided that she was going to tell her friends that one of her teachers sucks. Suspended for a day. Ten-year-olds, eight-year-olds, nine-year-olds. My son, when I was in Iowa, so I still have some beef with Iowa, I had to take him to school. One day they called up, they said, Mr. Benitez, we're going to have to talk. Your, your son did something very serious. I'm like, what? What he do? They're like, he said a very, very bad word. I said, oh? What he say? We're just not going to tolerate that here. Okay. What he say? He said, chocolate. I sat with that on the phone. So I was like, okay, let's talk more. So we go in. And uh, before we go in, Michael had already told us what had happened. But when we went in, this is the story that was provided. Mr. Benitez, Mrs. Benitez, your son called a young black woman the N-word. We're like, oh, wow, that's, right, that, like, that's interesting in, in my household, uh, particularly because we have those conversations. You see, part of the work is talking to kids early about how they deal with cops, 
and how we have to work three or four times as hard in order to get to the same place as their dominant peers. So they come and tell me, so what happened was that uh, 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 two kids, white kids, went and told the teacher that Mike had called a certain young black lady the N-word. And we said, okay, what else happened? They said, well, we brought Mikey in, they yelled at him and tried to school him and tell him just about everything they could tell him. This is why the N-word is wrong. And, 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 and you also can't use the term Negro. Now, I was particularly disappointed, right, at this white woman who never has attempted to teach something about blackness in her life, tell a young man about Negro being a bad word, when I still meet folks who are 70, 80 years old who prefer to be called Negro intellectuals over African Americans and blacks. So how do you think my son responded when she said, do you know what that is? He said, no. Um, he's eight. See, now I know, right, that I should have had that conversation when he was seven, but I was kind of waiting until he was 11. <laughs> but they taught him for me. So since then, I decolonized every day with my son after school. What did you learn? What were you taught? Okay, let's fill in the gaps. So now, when my son comes in, he marks the right answer that they want to hear, and then he draws a red line coming all the way across to the right that says, this is the answer, but here's your answer so I could get my damn A. Here's what really happened after not only my son was interrogated, but the young black girl for the first time also learned what the N-word meant from them. My son has a good friend. Her name is Jay. Let's call her Jay. He has another good friend. His name was T. Let's call him T. One day they decided that they wanted to play a secret game. Right? Eight-year-olds, they want to play a secret game with code names. So Jay went first and said, my skin tone is beautiful and dark like chocolate. So call me chocolate. Then Mikey stepped up. Mikey's like, well, I kind of look like caramel, so you could call me caramel. And then the young white boy said, well, I'm pretty white, so um, do you think that sour cream or Wonder Bread fits better? <laughs> they recommended Wonder Bread, so he, he stuck with Wonder Bread. Cold names, right? Not a racialized for negative causes, but they were just simply attaching color with different things as a way to play cold names. So one day, they come out, and you know how you line up for lunch? Uh, uh, during lunchtime, they take you out to the hallway when you're in middle school, and you're just kind of there, and everybody's in the line, and the, the teacher kind of takes everybody to, to the cafeteria. Well, that day, Jay and Mikey were fighting over the front. And she's like, Mikey, get your butt to the back of the, the line. And, and, and then Mikey's like, no, you get your butt to the back of the line. And they went back and forth for about 40 seconds or so. And to Mikey, then kind of got upset and said, oh, whatever, chocolate. And went back to the line. So that then, bringing it back around, two white kids came, heard that, went and told the teacher that he said the N-word. What's disappointing and disgusting about that is how they validated them. They didn't question like a counselor should do. They didn't uh, ask questions. I'm not talking about interrogating. Are you sure, young man? Are you sure? No. It's talking about, okay, what exactly happened? And how did it play out? And what words did, were, were used? But no, instead, they were you know, validated. Oh, thank you for telling us. And by the way, teachers went, took my son, interrogated him, and then told Jay how they're sorry that she was called the N-word. And for the first time, she also got introduced to the N-word. That's why this work is so, so important. Those are the issues that we're going to face in the schools, that we're going to continue to face, not continue to, to school folks and to take schools. Now, eventually, I made enough noise that the superintendent there got kicked out. They fired her. She, got, she was gone, not only because of that, but also some other stuff. So basically, they kind of said, damn, um, this is a heck of an incompetent superintendent. 
So let's get a new one, which I was pleased for, but did that have to happen? And how many times does something like that have to happen for us to actually realize what's going on? How close do we have to wait until issues of violence and brutality get close to home before we say, I care about this now? That is the question that we got to ask today. That is what upholding that legacy looks like. It is proactive and it is intentional. So I, I want to leave you with very particular words, okay? I would like you to know that the time is always now. It's not tomorrow. It's not the liberal understanding that assumes that things eventually are going to get better because time goes and people forget. No. Issues will linger. In the past 10 years, we've actually seen them get worse. We've even seen David Duke come back out, out of the woodworks, and actually now having conversations with de Blasio. So for this cat to get comfy after Tim Weiss put an ideological and intellectual whooping on him, something is happening that he's like, okay, I see uh, we're sort of coming back out. And you see it across all the cases, the evidence, what you've seen, unarmed uh, black men and, 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 and some brown men who are just getting shot left and right. And while I don't want to disbelieve, that is making me say, even police who are nice but choose not to call out their peers, not to do nothing about it, because the power dynamic tells them that they're going to get fired. Therefore, they prefer not to be fired. They prefer to stay in that position, be nice, but to let their peers get away with murder. I find that highly problematic, too. That silence is destructive. So please do not be silent. Please continue to engage and do this work to honor Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, Cesar Chavez, Ella, to uh, 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 Angela Davis, or even Gloria Steinem, Catholic police. It doesn't matter who. We must be able to, to feel comfortable speaking up irrespective of what folks are going to think or say. It could be a lonely place at times, but it's a really, really wonderful human space. Uh, when things happen and goals are achieved. So please always remember that the time is always now. Thank you very much. Now, in the event anyone has particular questions, I know I was asked to announce that so I guess my um, biggest question is, due to your past, when was your calling to become what you are today? Like, what inspired you to be what you are? Thank you, bro. Um, wow, when I was, when I was 14, uh, man, I'm not going to say I was an innocent boy. You know, like, I, I had my fun. Um, Never in a violent way, but I had my fun. So one day, me and my friends borrowed uh, my guidance counselor's car. <laughs> and he kept calling us and saying, return it. And you know, we took the 92 Ford Probe and kept cruising it. Uh, and um, not long afterwards, eventually, the cops caught on to us, which was going to happen. We weren't trying to run away. And when, when, when they put the lights on and, and they pulled us over, you know, we all knew we put our hands up and we got, we, we got out. Uh, you know, but the officer, for some reason, he, he decided that he still wanted to put that gun in my mouth. Uh, I was 14. I had no, no weapons, nothing. Uh, but you know, he, he had a boys in the hood moment. Uh, and wanted to show how tough he was and how I guess scary a gun could be, you know, it, it wasn't, it was scary because it was scary, but it wasn't scary because sometimes you grow up in communities and unfortunately it becomes something you see every day. But it was, it was, it was that, that, at that moment that I, I think I started to, to cultivate uh, that, that sense of, wow, like this is unnecessary and, and how do I do something uh, about it? But it wasn't really until then college. Uh, when when uh, uh, I went to Penn State, and y'all know there's a KKK headquarters in Belfont, Pennsylvania, about 20 minutes from uh, Penn State University. And in the late 90s, we started to get threats, particularly NAACP and Black Caucus. 
and the students mobilized and we mobilized them. You know, folks started getting threats that would say that somebody would find a black dead body in the woods of central Pennsylvania at some point. And of course, you kind of take it for, oh, it's a threat and it's not really going to happen. But about two months later, there was a young African American dead man found in the woods of central PA. So that got us really, really paranoid. And I think for the first time, I really saw how necessary uh, it was to do this work. You know, that and my children. Watching my children, and it, it, it takes you to another level of, of, of caring uh, that, that really informs your need to, to be a social justice advocate or an activist. And so I've been very, very involved and active uh, ever since. Uh, but I mean, an, an array of experiences. Uh, and they all culminate to basically kind of cultivate this person uh, in me that wants to address these issues. Uh, I do it unapologetically. I do it in education. Uh, I'll be the first cat to step up to somebody. If, you know, if they don't like me, I just don't know what to tell them. Like, my bust for being um, unapologetic. Uh, but it's in no way to disrespect. It's in no way to come across some tough guy. No, it's the reality of injustice and humanity and the way that it needs to be tackled. Uh, there's really no way around it but to, to take it on head on. So, um, hi, Angel. So you said it's kind of lonely being, you know, in your position. So how have you overcome that loneliness and that fear of being able to speak out, you know? No, it's not, not lonely in the position. Lonely in the work. You gotta understand, right? Like when you take this work seriously, that means that some of your friends are gonna make some jokes that are really not cool. That means that they're gonna say some derogatory things from time to time that you just like, where'd that come from? You know, and after a while you get tired of it and you're like, well, uh, I, I just can't, can't mess with you, you know, telling tell those type of jokes. So I gotta kind of pull you out on it. So say some other jokes, but why does it have to be something at the expense of someone else that this is somebody else, that marginalizes somebody else? So it gets a little lonely because that means being unpopular. Because a lot of folks don't want to think about that consciousness. A lot of folks don't want to think that the service of doing the work. Obviously, a lot of folks rather be maybe partying or having a good time or letting things slide. And that just sort of shows that that wasn't going to be me uh, you know, very early. And so that meant that any, at any time, somebody, I just did it the other day with some of my frat brothers. Right, the young frat brothers, you know, one in particular, he was like, oh, you know, a host and this and that. And I'm like, ah, hold up, man. Like, bro, like for real, man? Like, even in your, in your young age, you could still talk about, uh, you know, a fun, but without dissing and disrespecting women. <laughs> like, this disrespect for women, this, this, and, and this culture is insane, and, and it has to stop. And I don't know how else. To, to, to say that, because I'm going to raise young daughters, and we're going to raise princesses to be queens, we don't do it by acting one way, not modeling uh, what, what we hope to exemplify, and then when we ourselves have a daughter, we're like, oh, I'm going to protect her, put all the spaces, right? Patriarchal thinking around her, because I know what she has coming, because I'm that person. That's sick. So that's why it becomes a lonely place, right? Because sometimes you know you shut you shut it out. And you know, I watch my films. I'm not saying I don't have fun, because I could I could be a happy jokester. You know. What, what I'm saying is that I take humanity really seriously. And I'm concerned about humanity. Maybe you know a lot of folks aren't. Uh, but if we continue in this path, and we're gonna we're gonna have a very, very already destructive, but highly destructive. Uh, culture, if we don't start embracing respect for other human beings that we share life with, you know? Thanks. Okay, I had to type it so I wouldn't forget what I was thinking. Um, so as a white person, how do I avoid being lumped because I'm obviously in the dominant culture, but I'm trying to learn and like grow and bring about equality, but I have been privileged, but I don't want to be lumped as someone who's just avoiding it. You have to, um, at least for me, right, speak from scientific love. One, you got to be real about your intersections. 
right? I mean, there's a reality that you can present multiple identities. Uh, perhaps some privileged and some not very privileged. Um, but you can't, you can't prevent folks from lumping or universalizing or essentializing. I think the best practice that you can do is when issues come up, be honest and speak out and be in the front lines and be willing to be, to be a voice. Uh, and, and that's the best way really, I think, for, for, for any person is to exemplify what leadership and activism can look like at any time that somebody steps out of place or engages in some type of uh, behavior that is uh, discriminatory or, or marginalizing. It's really to, to call it out. So I don't know if I could answer sort of the, the how we prevent uh, ourselves from being clumped. Uh, but I think that our actions can speak a lot louder than words. I have a question. Um, how can we best inform ourselves on how to be positive catalysts for change in any society, whether it be just here at CSPSJU or, you know, when we leave here, out wherever we are? So that, you know, I, and I know there's a fair amount of undergrads, and, and so I, I want to answer this with sensitivity, but also with, with honesty and respect, because I was born some undergrads. <laughs> One thing I never did, uh, any time as an undergrad, that I had a friend, and I had an opportunity for many matters in particular to take advantage of a woman uh, when she's under the influence of alcohol, is that I, I restrained myself and I said, I'm not going there. Like, that's just wrong. Like, why would I want to partake in an intimacy and in an activity uh, where another person is, is not there? It's just wrong. So we have to be culturally reflective. I would not tell anyone not, not to drink. But I will say that please be cautious and mindful and understand yourself and, and your limits and how that's going to influence you. Also understand the liabilities and the dangers that come with engaging in, in, in that type of behavior and the position that you put yourself in uh, when, when you do. Whether that's a nasty joke or whether that's disrespecting a, a, a woman, whatever that is. So self-reflection, something we hardly, hardly do that we've been taught in many ways not to do, to be neutral, to be objective, when the reality is we are subjective beings. Uh, the second piece is self-healing. We gotta be able to take some time for ourselves uh, to be able to heal and, and, and to be able to kind of bring ourselves back to have to balance. That's how we can intentionally advocate uh, for ourselves and, and for the work so that we don't become overwhelmed. And the last piece is, have a sense of conviction about yourself. Until we start, until we stop letting others validate me or us, we're gonna have a real tough time with life. The moment that you cultivate a certainty of worth about yourself, uh, is the moment that you really get to see what does your circle look like? What does your circle look like? So you guys surround yourself, obviously, by, by, by positive people. And I'm pretty sure you can surround yourself with some clowns. I'm, I'm a clown. <laughs> but I'm also very selective and, 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 and picky with the way that I, the, that I surround myself. That doesn't mean that I don't have folks around me who, who don't act a fool. It just means that they know not to act the particular fool around me. <laughs> and I need to be OK. If they at the end say, I don't want to hang out with this dude. And that's the hard piece. Because we're too worried thinking about what others think about us than to worry about our own self-worth and the way that we present ourselves irrespective of who's thinking what. Why y'all think of the numbers? That was some staggering data. That literally showed a regression between the 1960s and 2015. And it's hard to look at that data. But it's very honest data. And we cannot do the work unless we understand that that's the narrative. That's the data. 
That's what it's showing us. Right on? Oh, absolutely. I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to point to the, uh, the work of, of Jasiri X, Juan Hood out of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and he does critical media literacy, and he has taken it upon himself to bring young people together uh, to do their own sort of translation of what the stories look like in their respective communities. You know, so that's one example of a space that is carved out for young people to define themselves, not to be defined uh, by others. So I think that's one phenomenal uh, uh, particular project that is going on. I know when you look at juvenile centers in particular, uh, who do artistic work and poetry and film and who, who, who not come to proper organizations going and work hand in hand on skill building and actions, not just necessarily let's go chill with them and talk for 30 minutes, or let's not just go and wrap up sandwiches. Uh, and, and, and I say that to say that we have to be intentional not only about the way we help, but also about how we engage in the action piece of it. Service will always be service, and I will always appreciate, for me personally, uh, the way that particularly that we travel around the world and think about famine, and think about hunger, and think about poverty, and think about the different ways that we intervene, but until we actually have the conviction to step up to the structural play, uh, those issues are always going to be there, and we will never provide the tools for self-empowerment and self-determination that communities need so that they can sustain themselves. And that in itself is a colonial, a contemporary colonial strategy. Yeah? Yeah. Oh, hi, my name is Amanda. I just want to say thank you so much for coming here today. Um, we love to do with a lot of things about tonight. So I just want to say thank you so much for your passionate work. So, yeah. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. How we doing? Hopefully, uh, that's your thinking. When you think about MLK, you really got to reflect deeply about what he stood for and the work that he attempted to achieve and, and what he died for and what many others died for. It's really, really important. We, we can't continue. I think for me, I'm at a point where I, I love the celebration and I can engage the festivity, uh, but it gets really, really tough uh, talking about things that we celebrate for one day. And then we go on about our lives and we don't engage the, the, the cultural practice of the work in our lives and the work that we do and then we wait for the next year. And then it's the same thing without paying attention to the issues that he actually cared about and stood up for. It almost makes no sense to me. And, and that's why I felt the need to, to address this lecture in a very particular way. Uh, because it's important and we can continue. Last year was hard. Last year was hard to see over and over that many, not only black, black and brown men, but the amount of black and brown women too, that a lot of people are not talking about. And, and often don't talk about that have also been killed uh, uh, and, and, and violated at the hands of the police. It's astronomical. It's, it's just really no reason for it. Not police officers who are purchasing tanks and purchasing body armor and, 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 and treating our, our own citizenry uh, uh, like, like we are uh, attempting to, to, to destroy this nation makes no sense. And if we had any understanding and sense of humanity and a big heart, uh, that would hurt us. I'm hurt every time that I see something like that on TV, that I see something like that happen, whether it's close or whether it's distant or whether it's the 2,000 Nigerians who were, who were genocided and killed and you think that nobody talked about them, but they talked about friends all day in the media, all the time. Things like that are, are saddening because they make very evident of what, what's privileged, what's valued, what's important, and, and what's not. And uh, eventually we're going to have to step up and do something about it very serious. Right on?